This is Moment Tonight. To welcome many thanks for joining us. We bring you the real stories. <laughs> <laughs> My environment alone will tell you that I'm rich. I've chosen to be in one of the very shallow places. They also do have misguns, but it doesn't mean that all of them are criminals. We do not have a good geo database of our mineral resources. This is a time for us to share the oil money. So terrorism is not going to be accepted on this continent. You see them coming here and going back there, don't be killed. But God willing, I'll be back alive. We are just about leaving on the night patrol with the AU forces here in Somalia. The real issues, the real talk. We are working together for the development of Ghana. It means that we have separation of power. Really, we're talking about moving from what? A deficit of some 9% to 6.5%. The critical challenge that faces every leader in the world today is the issue of creating jobs. We will put at least 1 million people to work. Ghana, after 60 years, has a public structure that is not responsive. Join me, Abdul Hai Moment. Moment tonight, from Monday to Friday, 8.15 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. on GBC 24. All right, welcome. Uh, this is Moment Tonight. We are live on GBC 24. My name is Abdul Hai Moment. And tonight we are taking a look at the World Economic Forum that was 2019 and uh, typically in, involved in this year's um, uh, World Economic Forum is a very young Ghanaian and our interest this evening is to find out how he got involved in this and uh, what the World Economic Forum means even to us here as Ghanaians, as we battle with uh, our own economic crisis in the banking sector, with unemployment, and, and all the other issues that come with the economy, uh, we'll find out what uh, some of the thematic areas will be uh, when the conference kickstarts. And I have here with me a very young man, uh, Emmanuel Agbeko Gamo. He is uh, with the World Economic Forum. He's a World Economic Forum member, but beyond that, he's also done a lot of work here in Ghana, and I'll be asking him to tell us that for himself. Ima, thanks to uh, for, for accepting our invitation to, to join us here in our studio to have this very important discussion. Thank you so much, Moomin. Um, thank you, and to your esteemed uh, audience as well, Afishapa. Is you know, <laughs> yeah, I think come back to you. I must confess, I... I I spoke with you a few days ago and I got some information about the World Economic Forum, uh, which you are a member of. Yes. But my confession is that I never for one moment thought that you would have anything to do with the economy of Ghana, mm. much more the economy at the world level. Yes. And that's because um, when I first got to meet you, yes. it was at a VOA yes. training yes. where you were one of the <laughs> facilitators. Yes. And so I've always known you to be an IT expert, social media guru, and yes, so on and so yes, forth. Yes, yes, How yes. did you get into the economics of the world? Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the question. And it's such an honor to be here and on this platform. Um, you've been doing a great work here, and I appreciate the platform. Thank you GBC, very much. we have a, a long-standing mm, relationship, mm. as you just mentioned, with the Voice of America Radio. And I've been a fan of all of the hard work that people have been doing, especially the New Year. So mm. it's an exciting <laughs> time to start the New Year with you and the GBC family and audience. Um, so in my previous um, life or capacity, I, I worked with Google Ghana and did some stuff with YouTube. Mm. And by the time that I engaged with you, I um, was working with Voice of America Radio and the Broadcasting Board of Governors, um, which typically funds a lot of media outside of the U.S. So part of their program in partnership with um, USAID and the U.S. Embassy is really to help us give support to online journalism, um, digital journalism, and also to look at ways in which 
and we can tell and broadcast our stories um, in the best possible light. So I've spent quite a bit of my career over the last 10 years um, being very good at communication and digital. Um, my past life um, was also with the newspaper business, mm -hmm. first in DC, and then I also worked with Global Media Alliance and at a point hosted a tech show on YFM called The Empower mm -hmm. Show. So mm -hmm. I have a rich background in media. Um, but one of the things that I've also done consistently is to be part of organizations that are committed to improving the state of the world. Um, so one of them is I'm a proud Rotarian. I volunteer with Rotary Club. And then another one um, is the World Economic Forum. So the World Economic Forum is a non-profit organization that was started in 1971 um, by a German economist, um, Professor Klaus Schwab. And the idea of that was how do we convene the most influential political economic leaders in creating an agenda that improves the state of the world. So over the years, um, what has happened is that in January, there's been this fantastic conference hosted in Davos, um, Cluster Davos in Switzerland, um, and it's usually quite cold. So once you fly in there for that week, you're, you're kind of stuck there. So it forces a lot of people who are influential, a lot of um, political people to say, okay, we're here, we're seated at a table, what are the ways that we can collaborate um, and resources and strategy and uh, as well as many other things in meeting what the forum says improving the, the state of the world um, so this has been happening fairly frequently some of um, the noteworthy um, convening of the forum has had um, Nelson Mandela um, ahead of um, apartheid happening it's also had um, the president of China the first head of state giving an address last year um, the head of state of India also gave an address at the you know, forum. I'll, I'll, I'll get into those details <laughs> Sure, I'd sure. like us to take it chronologically yeah, no and how you ended up where you are. You've okay. told us about your experience with the VOA. You've yes. told us about your experience with Google, uh, about with those Accra Hub, right? Exactly. And then, yes. oh, of course, now you're a member of the World Economic Economy Forum. Yes. And then also you did tell us about the Rotary Club. Yes. I'm sit sitting here I, almost every day. I get to engage young men and women yes. who have completed school and are still looking for jobs. Right. You have engaged. You have been engaged in various capacities in different organizations. Yes. And you're still very young. How did you do that? So maybe your story could inspire somebody out there that there are other ways sure. of getting to do things instead of just sitting, you know, and writing application letters all the time. And, and I appreciate this question. And, and one of the things I acknowledge, especially for us as young people, there's a huge youthful population. And the world we're meeting is quite different from what our parents met. So typically, especially my older brothers and sisters in Rotary said, once they came out of or graduated from Legon or Tech, there was a job waiting for you because you were being trained to fill that capacity. Um, so I attended Presbyterian Boys Secondary School. I'm a proud of that year. Mm. I have a lot of my <laughs> colleagues watching and a huge shout out to them mm. as well. Um, but shortly afterwards, I had the chance to do college or university abroad. Um, I came back to Ghana in 2012 and did my national service with Global Media Alliance. Um, but one of the things that I've realized here is, and a lot of people who are entrepreneurial minded say this all the time, there are so many opportunities here we have a lot of challenges um, and so one of the things that's been helpful in my personal journey is one understanding and goal setting for my professional life but also being open to opportunities that are volunteer based or happening there was a lot of political um, discontent social media was really active and a lot of young people we had a voice and so the world economic forum said wait a minute we've been engaging with these top level people how about the young millennials how about the young people who we seem to be the largest demographic in population across the world not just in africa same in india same in china what are we thinking what do we want um, so my personal engagement was to volunteer for some of those so anybody who's listening to this is yes have a strong work ethic have a goal that you set, but also be open to volunteering and doing things that I've done with the mm. VOA, with GBC, because those opportunities mm. might, might show you um, things that you probably did not initially think you are, you, you'd want to be, but then they'll also open up opportunities like what I've been able to do. So through the World Economic Forum Global Shapers, I've visited Mauritius, um, South Africa. We've had conferences. This will be my second time in Switzerland, um, first in G Geneva, now in Davos. Mm. Because I volunteered my time to adding to, to understanding 
when we talk about private-public partnerships, which was a huge topic two years ago, um, some colleagues of, I, uh, of mine, um, and, and John Ama, Atu Ozanapia, Deborah Hinkra, uh, most of us now call us Suman, um, and he, he serves at the Council of the President. Um, now Patrick Stevenson, some of these young people, we volunteered our time to look at the topics that were being spoken about globally, and said, okay, as Ghanaians, we can't just wait for them to make those decisions. How do we interrogate those topics? So at the time, we invited the minister for PPP, Honorable mm. Papo, to come engage with us and say, we have questions. What does that mean? Then we submitted our report and we sent it to Davos. And we said, whilst well, we're thinking about it over there, we also have our needs here. So speak with us. And so those type of opportunities that were not necessarily paid were the ones that have opened these opportunities and this continued engagement that I found myself with with the World Economic mm. Forum. Okay, so I'll come to ask you how beneficial the World Economic Forum will be to us here in Ghana. But before I do that, yes. so you have also mentioned that this uh, forum has been going on for decades. Yes. Uh, but really, what are some of the tangible achievements? And that's a great question. So there are two parts. There are people who, especially from the 80s and 90s, um, saw this as a lot of rich people, a lot of influential people get to have great um, kind of like first-class treatment and then they meet journalists and they have a platform. Um, is this a talk shop? What does that look like? So there, one, one of the best things that we've realized is that conversation births forth ideas. Ideas birth forth action steps. And usually these actions are what inform or future cast the world we live in. So it's very important that we have conversations with diverse people, but it's also important that the people who are currently tasked with responsibility and privileged with power hear from us. So that talk shop is necessary. Annually, we need to be engaged in that. So having the CEO of, of Microsoft, having Matt Zuckerberg mm -hmm. and others in the same room as somebody like me who at one point I was living in Aodome Estates and attended Presec, <laughs> speaks to the fact that mm -hmm. I'm a global citizen. Mm -hmm. My opinion matters. Right. Another part that the World Economic Forum has uh, been able to do is to create agenda councils. Um, so convene a lot of people in academia and specialists so that they come out with annual and biannual reports. What is the state of the media? What is the state of climate change? What is the state of commerce? What does that look like? Um, and over the last three years, Professor Schwab has been incredibly keen and targeted on what he has coined the fourth industrial revolution. And um, what that really is in academia um, uh, is the convergence of all the technologies that we're using now. So it's not just the internet anymore. It is now artificial intelligence. It is also automation. It is also um, the internet of things. It's also cloud computing. So whilst we're here in Ghana, we might think that these things seem broad or they seem so distant. But actually, they're not. Most of the decisions that people make in terms of internet security, it affects us locally. Once we have these uh, devices that are plugged into WhatsApp, into Facebook, there's an agenda that is set by someone. So for us, we cannot, similar to what I spoke about when we were first learning of private-public um, partnerships, mm -hmm. where now it's become the order of the day and our government has been one of the champions heralding that for development. Most of the development that we've seen lately, a good example is the renovation happening um, at the Kotoka International Airport for those who may not have visited Terminal 3. And one of the members of the World Economic Forum, Ruben Atekbe, he's the founding curator for um, the Accra Hub of the Global Shapers. Mm -hmm. But he was also instrumental. So two years ago, understanding that these are the things or schemes, whether financial or economic, and for us now, and those of us in the internet hearing about the fourth industrial revolution, they are structured. But for us to participate, we need to be part of the conversation. We need to understand what does it mean for us? Where do we plug in? And then also, then when there are big global policies, and a good example is the Sustainable Development Goals. So our president, Akufado uh, Adodankwa, he is one of two chairpersons, he and President Paul Kigami of Rwanda, yeah. who are champions of the Sustainable Development Goals. So we see people with it colors. But what does that mean to us? Were we there when they were putting it together? Mm. Which part of it is realistic? Which part can we push back? And then over the next five to ten years, which parts of the development goals can relate to the type of job skills that young people need to have now so that they can be employable? So that's really how the World Economic Forum relates to us. The macro level understanding that. And then understanding that we've always had um, members in, who are influential in our community who are part of the World Economic Forum and continue to do so. And they chat out their agenda for our country as well. You mentioned very powerful names. Um, you mentioned the CEO of Microsoft, Mark Zuckerberg, and a host of other very powerful names. Here, yeah. And then you did mention that you sit in the same room with such powerful people. But really, the question is then how powerful? It's your voice as against the voice 
of such powerful people, such powerful nations. Tell me about that. So when we speak, yes, do people listen? And that's the that's the fascinating thing. Yes, they do. And I think part of it is also this: you need to be strategic about knowing what what your voice is and articulating it. So, of course, when President Donald Trump, as a single voice, speaks in his role as president, mm -hmm. it seems not to be it seems to cover up a whole myriad of them. But when we speak as young voices, so I mentioned the Global Shapers community, which is about six years old, and Accra is one of the strong ones. There's a Global Shaper hub in every major city on the continent. Every city has one, Abuja, Lagos, Mauritius, South Africa. And every time I travel, I make it a point to engage with us. When we speak in one voice, and we published a book, and I, I have a copy for you in the, in the card that I'll oh, give to you. Oh, I'm grateful to have it. Africa 80. We came together and we just shared our stories. And as Africa 80, that shared a snapshot of what the future that we wanted. And the world listened. We were able to speak with the African Union and say that, listen, this is a documentation of what we're saying. So individually, you might feel a little discouraged, but collectively, we do have a voice. And the only way that we can push back or people can realize it is when we exercise that voice, is when we engage with these type of global organizations and we say, oh, you didn't know that we could articulate. Mm -hmm. Oh, with the internet, we can research. So ahead of the forum, I'm incredibly excited because I get to read about some of their bios. I get to read about some of the state. But most importantly, I've also shared on social media, I get to listen to what are our needs locally. And we speak about 2019 and, and the economic um, hardships that we're feeling. Most of what people might think of young people and millennials is that we're lazy. And it cannot be further from the truth. We're dynamic. We're entrepreneurial. There's so many creatives that have come out of it. But what we need is the commercialization of the talents that we show mm. now. Mm. So when I go forward to the World Economic Forum, I'm no longer presenting somebody who's just here to, to, for fun. I am presenting a challenge and saying, whilst we're creating an agenda, can that agenda include the commercialization of the new skills that we have now, the new skills that young people are able to express on the continent? Do you have the backing of the state? Does our government know about you? Uh, have they given you any support if they know about you? So, Yes, um, to an extent, um, but not extensively. So what happens with the Global Shapers is we're also a volunteer organization. There's a hub in Accra, there's a hub in Ho, a hub in Kumasi, Cape Coast, as well as Tamale. Um, what we do is we normally make sure that one or two of our members are affiliated in the office. So we have um, Mal Kenny, mm -hmm. um, Ribeiro, she's recently married, and Kora Suman, who is a legal counsel um, at the Jubilee House. The president and typically most governments have an entourage that go there. I think this year, this still hasn't been confirmed, but mm. we definitely will have a representation. Um, probably the Minister of Foreign Affairs, um, she would be present, presenting us. And so we're part of that delegation that right. gets to speak mm. um, and engage with that. Um, but we're definitely more open. We, we would love to have a much more direct link because some of the things that I think for us, our organization tries to be focused on the economics. And so we're, we don't necessarily have a political affiliation with one party, mm -hmm. but we understand the politics of letting young people have a voice. Um, so we're always appealing that, yes, we're open. We're open to engage. We have members who span all the political party spectrums, members who span all the religious spectrums, and we would love um, to use the platform to engage with our government so that we also translate a lot of the things that the government is doing that hasn't been highlighted in the right seat. Exactly. That, that's uh, what, what the focus of my question really is, because um, if you have the backing of the government or you have collaboration with the government, whichever government uh, uh, it is, what it will mean is that we do not have two different voices. That the government says one thing through its representatives and then the global shapers uh, from Ghana yeah. say another, uh, then you don't have a focus. Mm. That's, so you're saying this collaboration is not as deep as you would want it to be. So we're a strategic organization. And so by that, based on our constitution, we're very in line with... Um, whatever government is in there. So I mentioned mm. some of the members who are currently affiliated mm. because one of the most important things is for us to be uh, on on task and on brand with what Ghana is doing. So we recognize and are very aligned with the current administration on the Ghana Beyond Aid, but also understanding that we live in a collaborative world where a lot of young people need voices. So on that front, we are on the same page with um, exactly what the government of Ghana and our beautiful country projects out, out, um, outward. But what we would love to have is a stronger collaboration, not just with government, with academia as well. I think there's a lot of, and, and this is something that 
a lot of people or a lot of young people kind of neglect. There's a lot of good work that comes out of the business schools or the economic and political science departments of University of Ghana, Tech, um, Ashesi and others. But they seem to be just siloed in those spaces. Mm. And so one of the things that the World Economic Forum, besides just bringing political um, and economic powers together, is coming up with these kind of papers on the state of the world by academics. And we would love to have a lot more of our academics push. So for us, the call is for that intentionality. Um, when it comes to how we speak and what we say during the forum, we're strategically in line with the mm -hmm. government. We're mm -hmm. constantly strategically in line with our national development plan. But when it comes to the follow-up, all the work that is done before we meet for the publication, we would love to have a much deeper, stronger affiliation um, in that sense as well. I find it interesting uh, that this year's uh, forum has the theme globalization. Globalization 4.0. <laughs> yeah, yes. that, that's interesting. But again, I'll ask you to explain why globalization at this time because i find a world where from where i sit yes we are beginning to look inward yes as individual countries rather than look at it uh, things from the global point of view Precisely. so britain says brexit yes. so they're leaving the eu um you go to the us today and what is trending is donald trump saying look the wall uh, must be built to stop Mexicans from crossing to the US and so on. I mean, there are so many issues in the world today that shows that we are more divided mm. than united. Mm. You are talking about globalization at this Global, year's yeah. World Economic Forum at a time when it appears as if we all want to go our individual ways. Yes, and so the topic is globalization 4.0, um, the architecture for a global world um, during the fourth industrial revolution. And I think the reason why there's a 4.0 and others is the, we cannot take away from the fact that we live in a global economy now. So um, trade barriers have really been reduced. With the internet, you can actually live or have a shared experience with somebody in other continents simultaneously. We can make phone calls and interact, share currencies and other things, and us, some of my friends here who, who are designers, and you can sell almost globally with the right platforms and vice versa. We also enjoy global products in that way. So at least the early stages of globalization have been realized. I think the 4.0 speaks again to um, what I mentioned earlier about the World Economic Forum's purpose in the fourth industrial revolution. So in this revolution where now there's artificial intelligence, and so um, Google, for example, now has named Ghana as the center for artificial intelligence. It makes us very excited to be on the continent because that means that there's going to be a lot of resources in thinking about how the um, computers, um, how really we can be able to leverage technology in order to make things um, improve. But the topic right now also speaks to security. Um, and then you hinted a bit about that when you were asking about patriotism versus being a global citizen. Mm. So we're finding that political systems or democratic governance as is being, was being practiced is being challenged. So now people are saying, well, what is the expense of us being global if the small national resources that we have, we have to share to mm. be in a, a regional block, exactly. being part of an EU? <laughs> Those have implications for us, even on the continent, whether it's ECOWAS, whether it's SADAC, and then the African Union. Um, so the agenda, that's one of the beauty of Davos. It, it kind of precipitates these challenges that are global so that we can ask them. Then it gives insights for us and say, how do we narrate and how do we fix and how do we work through that? So, so let, me, let me, sorry if I truncated your thoughts there, yeah. but come to Ghana. Yes. And then let me localize our, our problems here. Excellent. You go to Circle. Yes. Where you have a lot of phone business ongoing. Yes. And then, well, our investigations here at GBC show that yes. most of them are Nigerians. Mm. And the Ghana Union of Traders Association are up in arms against them because they say foreigners should not be engaged ah. in retail trade. Yes. And so at a point in time in this country, yes. we had a lot of demonstrations, yes. you know, and, and you are talking about globalization. Yes. I'm looking at patriotism. Yes. I'm a Ghanaian, first of all, Fantastic. before I'm a citizen of, of the, the world. world. Yes. Uh, foreigners are coming to take the space yes. that belongs to Ghanaians. Yes. And we saw what happened in South Africa not too long ago. Very good. Uh, I mean, how, how, how do you 
how do you narrate and navigate yes, that? Exactly. And I love this question because um, for me, I'm, I'm currently an academic. I'm studying at University of Witwatersrand, mm. uh, the business school. And the program I'm in is managing innovation. And it's been a fascinating eye-opener because a bit of what you speak about being in South Africa, um, mostly most of last year, has mm -hmm. given me mm. both a perspective of why there might be xenophobia, but also the understanding that most of the time when we break down um, the national pie or economic pie to something as small as that what i think and this is personal it's not necessarily the view of the forum world mm. economic forum mm. or anything else but it's also because we're not innovating enough and a lot of times what that does is we need to find out ways in which we don't stifle innovation so i'm a student of innovation and everything has a shelf life so i love that you spoke about cell phones the boom of cell phones and we speak to that as a technology on the continent mm. and now in most Africans we have two or three cell phones and access to that but what we don't have is true access to internet so you may make calls and texts but for you to leverage the phone's full economic value you need to have subsidized or almost zero internet stuff so that you can build businesses then the cost of use is at minimum to the customer or to the entrepreneur but in the space where we're not innovating for that, we start to fight over the sales of cell phones. Whereas in China now, it's, they've reduced high quality phones to almost very little. And they're competing with Apple brands with Xiaomi and others. I use this example and try to match it because we have an innovation center in Kumasi, Xiaomi Magazine. And they're able to fix and build all these things. Where we become, and this is the same with South Africa, this is the same with Europe and America, is when you stop innovating and you start to look at the shelf life of a product or service, then you start to use political gimmicks or you start to use exclusionary gimmicks to say that, oh, the pie is not big enough, let's keep Nigerians out. The pie is not big enough, let's keep these people out. And unfortunately for us, we've seen this in the drastic, most drastic case. Um, so I did political science at the University of Florida. Political scientists in that respect, anytime you start to exclude a group of people, you create a slippery slope. Because then when does it stop? Mm. Then you start to say, okay, then who are the original people who came to circle? Maybe, well, no, we're in Accra. We're in Greater Accra mm. region. So the guys deserve mm. to be the economic activity there. And that's a problem. So anytime you have economic activity and you have a challenge of xenophobia, it is because we failed to innovate beyond the shelf life of the product or service. If we open and expand the mobile phones into other forms um, of business, that Ghanaians, we have an innate competence. That's what we need to be looking at. What are we good at? How does that plug into, as I spoke about, the fourth industrial revolution or the internet world? How do Ghanaians, we sp we're Anglophone, first of all. We're in incredibly culturally aware. Our music, our culture, our food is internationally exportable. Anybody who comes, you don't even have to sell them. As soon as they taste it, they want more of that. We have structures that are being put in place for us to build. We have family members who are in the diaspora who can tell us what is relevant in the world almost with a phone. How do we leverage that so that our local economies now grow and expand? And you can use Singapore as an example. You can use Dubai as an example. Now, Dubai, the Emiratis, there are fewer Emiratis, indigents of Dubai, than there are expats. There are more people who are foreign who are working in Dubai. And so what they've done is they flipped a local industry that mm. says, we are closed, we don't want anyone, to making, and, it used, and it's beautiful, if, and for those of you who might have traveled mm. with me, but my first time in Dubai, there's a story of Dubai on their walls. And they talk about a small fish town yeah. in the desert, mm. almost 30 to 40 years ago, that nobody would ever fly mm. to. Today, you and I have colleagues, I have younger cousins, older ones, and there are businesses that I know of, global businesses I've consulted with, that have set up consulting shops in Dubai. Why? Because instead of them becoming protectionists and saying that we don't want you, we don't, they decided to innovate and say, wait a minute, we can have you come yeah. use our tourism. We can have you come in and add money. And now their GDP, so the government of Dubai, the Emiratis, they benefit from an expanded GDP. Mm -hmm. They're also one of the largest economies that does um, telehealth and, and health innovation. So people fly to Dubai, to Dubai for healthcare. So if we start to hold on to our circle and our small, what that does is one, it, it, it gives us the false reality that we've reached our capacity for innovation, where we haven't barely scratched the surface. Secondly, we lose the opportunity to be able to create new things. When I come with my diverse experience and you come with your diverse, even if we're looking at the same thing, all of a sudden, it looks different. 
like Alikoto, those of us who grew up, the big pen and then the uh, energizer battery yeah, and the yeah. blue thing. True. Yes, when you fi- first see the big pen, first somebody will tell you was well, the cover of the mm. pen. Somebody will say, oh, this is part of the battery. Mm. Somebody looks at it different and says, no, I can use it for a game, I spin top, yeah. and it becomes something else. Yeah. So instead of using our energies to protect the little that we have that is already diminishing, let us welcome people with the right policies. Let's look at examples of economic situations where innovation has taken charge, not xenophobia, where global awareness with strategy, you don't just, of course, open up your borders, but you look at what diversity do people bring, and then let's start innovating. Circle is such a phenomenal place. The footprint, Circle and Osu, of people who come there daily is amazing. Okay. I, I, wouldn't you, first of all, have recommended that we have an Africa economic forum ah. before a world economic forum? Yes. Because it does appear that they, at the global level, yes. whenever Africa engages the world, yes. whether positive or negative, we are always at the losing end. Mm. Uh, and so even where there are economic arrangements, and you yes. refer to the EPA, yes. we find out that uh, at the end of it all, Ghana will not benefit as much as its European partners and so on. Uh, for example, if you take the airline industry, yes. To fly to, say, Gabon yes. from Ghana, yes. I would first of all have to fly to Europe, yes. then to get to back to Africa. That does not augur well for any business. Yes. Shouldn't we focus on Africa yes. before we get out to the world? And I love this question because um, it speaks to our intent and how we look at things in a chronological order. Um, some problems, you can look at it in chronological order, but some of them, there's a bias, thinking mm. that the chronological order would solve things. But then really, some of the economic situations have to be f- solved concurrently. The reason concurrently is we have an ECOWAS, we have the African Union, um, and it's been an exciting past um, few days. And mm. one of the things that I'd, I'd, I'd say is my affiliation with the Global Shapers, um, we had our last, I think, um, two conferences on Africa, and it was in Addis Ababa. So my, the reason I was in Ethiopia was because of the World Economic Forum and for us global shapers. And we were spoken to at the AU because there's a one, 20, Agenda 2063 as well as a youth charter. And within those agendas, it speaks to correcting some of the historical problems that we still are, have inherited right now. And when I speak to that is, if we look at our geographic economic establishment, most of our capital cities are port cities where there's a relationship with past colonial masters and that's where development has traditionally happened we need to be intentional about breaking those apart and having development be equitable in rural as well as capital spaces most of the airlines and the airlines and i had a a chance to study a bit about airlines Mm -hmm. they they function on on very slim margins it's a it's highly um, capital intensive endeavor and you cannot uh, flout on regulation. Mm. It has to be perfect. It, these are people's lives in the air. Right. Uh, so the airline business is fairly expensive, um, but it's also demand driven. The more people who fly on there, the more you can subsidize and reduce the rates. And so traditionally, most people who have traveled or found funds to travel has been Europeans coming. So if you look at our airline pathways, coming in here, you would find it it's so much cheaper to travel from the U.S., um, to West Africa, to South Africa, North Africa, than it is to travel inland. And you find out that the responsibility of us creating those world-class airlines and airports doesn't lie with the European tourists who are coming in, who don't mind going to your South Africa, Zoyazam, but it lies in with intra-country trade. So that speaks to what is required of us in having our regional block and also speaks to um, the other eight forum conferences that happen. So there's a forum in Africa. Um, the first time I attended was in 2015. Typically one is hosted in South Africa and then in, in, in another country. This year's forum in Africa will be happening in Cape Town um, sometime after Easter as well. And that's an opportunity for the forum to, to try, kind of be like a neutral ground for that agenda to happen. But what I would love to, um, um, to admit also is lately, specifically in Rwanda, um, so I've been there a few times as well, and President Paul Kagame has been intentional about leveraging now being um, uh, heading the African Union using that position of power to influence us so that by the time we meet at the table we have a collective agenda on what we want and how we require and that's been something that's been used against I spoke a bit of historical political um, reasons why our geographic and economic cities are built that way 
in the past, when we moved to a global table, how many of our countries, even if it's just ECOWAS, move us a block? Is there transparency for us to learn, both politicians and academics and economists, to say this is what we need, this is the united front we have, and this is how we're going to implement it? Gratefully, I can speak a bit to um, the Visa Free Africa Initiative mm -hmm. and also the AU Passport. And these are deliberate ones. And also to, to quite a number of countries, Ghana being consistently the flagship nation that says that, listen, we're committed to visa on arrival. We're committed to visa free. Ghana consistently leading the charge and saying, listen, we need to have um, kind of an airline industry that allows or, or allows us to have a subsidized transportation airline so that, like you're saying, we can fly mm -hmm. into countries. These are initiatives that I can proudly beat my chest that the AU has championed. Um, there are some countries that had a pause, South Africa and Nigeria, because they are big and they see they, they are bigger economic powers, so they are a bit hesitant in joining. But consistently, Ghana has always been number one in signing up for the, the regional and pan-African integration that leads to some of these things that would reduce the prices. So when you think about it that way, if we are at the table and we make those decisions, how does it affect your local Ghanaian? Now when you come to Ghana Terminal 3, mm -hmm. visa on arrival. We're one of the first countries, even mm. before Ethiopia, mm. with their airlines opened up for it. Um, looking at different things, subsidies, some of our programs that we have, sustainable um, SDGs, sustainable development goals, a lot of the social impact mm. and the funding that a lot of people get out here, some of them for fashion, some of them for education, they come because Ghanaian representatives spoke up, we, we signed up, and we said, listen, and as much as we're patriotic, and as much as we're Ghanaian, we've always, right from... Uh, Kwame Nkrumah's time, been one of the first countries to say, we're interested in the Pan-African and regional integration, mm. and we're willing to pay our quota to make it better for all of us. So, I'm just continuing in a long succession mm. of right. intended strategy. Globalization 4.0. Yes, sir. Um, I have a few questions still on that. Yes. You see, uh, we have our traditions in Ghana, we have yes. our culture, yes. but when you meet at the global level, yes then most of the time the African culture is ignored mm. and sometimes suppressed mm. uh, in terms of the economy. Yeah. So for instance, the Western nations can say, if you engage in child labor on cocoa farms, mm. we will not patronize your cocoa products, yes. your beans and so on and so forth, without taking into consideration the peculiar cultural norms mm. within our borders yes. that if I'm a cocoa farmer yes. and my son comes to me on my cocoa farm yes. I'm not necessarily engaging him in work yes. but in Africa children tend to take the trade of their parents so yes. if I'm a blacksmith my my child closes from school and yes. comes to me he naturally would be sent to bring me that uh, you know uh, iron or that hammer here and there Talk about early marriage, and yes. then Western nations descend on, on Africa and yes. say, you, you, your, your girls cannot marry before they are age 16, yes. and yes. yet they can have sex when they are 16 years. Mm -hmm. That, for me, is contradictory. Right. It, in, so African norms are usually, from where I sit, yes. ignored. Mm. And then we are introduced to very new you know, laws and norms that do not sit well with mm. us. What's your response? Thank you for this, uh, Moomin, and, and it's a fascinating response because I, I, I like what, how you framed it in terms of culture and appreciation. And the way I'll tackle this is a lot of what we have now and that speaks to, for example, the definition of um, youth. When somebody says youth, mm. we pick it from the UN's charter, yeah. uh, whether it's under 35, the specific mm. demographics. When we say um, countries are below the poverty line in economics, these are there are global organizations, IMF and others that we pick, and then we work our day our way down by states as well. Um, in terms of cultural norms, one of the challenges is that obviously the Western culture is what put together a lot of the global institutions that sometimes we go to mm. also when we need aid, mm. and we go to when we need to look at humanitarian. So. For example, um, and my uncle, Kabrabli Ameha, was a journalist mm. in this country, mm. and I, I was staying with him. Um, oh, really? At, at, especially, mm. yeah, especially when he reported on, on um, I think, the justices that were murdered during the PNDC time. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was one of, I was a young kid at that time, but he spoke up and he quoted human rights violations that were charted on a global level that still have 
presidents or jurisprudence here, even if at the time the political um, apparatus at the time did not recognize it. Mm. I say that to show the impact of how we've been able to leverage or use such charters that speak to access to basic education, access, so things like water, those things are put in the UN Charter, a UNDP as well as for, for children, those things are borrowed, but then they're also then implemented regardless of what political apparatus we have. Why it's important for us to engage is that in putting some of those documents together, just like a constitution which is a living document, it didn't include all of our cultural nuances. Because for us, political independence was priority when we, we first engaged. And it's, it seems to be what it still is. Most of the 50-something African states were practicing some type of democracy, but we're still not really mm. deeply entrenched in democratic um, freedom, where you can say that Ghana is one of the beacons, but then we still have room to grow. Right. And we know that. So what is happening now is, in our lives, we're pushing back at these charters because a lot of the folks that were initial architects, they lent their cultural practices on it. So for me, without the specifics on, on what it is in terms of child labor and others, we have an opportunity to have our academics to say, listen, these were informed by life, cultural practices, the economics, the agenda, the development plans are informed by practices in a specific space. Where are our practices in Sub-Saharan Africa, locally, our apprenticeship, all the things that we do th that, that make us um, Ghanaian innately, how are they brought up so that mm. they're included? So that when these global charters that are wide sweeping, that we call on when it's convenient for us, but that we challenge and fight, um, all of a sudden, it should include our voices. And these are the opportunities for us to charge us. The UN recently came up with a strategy for uh, young people. And the UN has just recognized that with the youthful population, young people need to take part in these. Otherwise, these institutions will break. Uh, th they might seem to sit at top, but then the adoption of it on the ground, a bit of what you're saying mm -hmm. is not there. So they're asking for us to, to engage. But if we also do not engage, then it's going to be a, a repetition of um, a culturally not nuanced but exclusionary policy mm -hmm. that in intent was done right but then we push back so i think for me a lot of what we see now is the second stage after we've we've been able to get political independence we need to be looking at economic independence in all spans of the word innovatively not a, not from an exclusionary lens oh we have small so we'll hold on mm -hmm. to it but we have to be creative and we also have to be open and understand that Moments of learning come in diversity and when we're not comfortable. And I think that speaks to the bigger mm. picture of why global conversations matter. Mm. Those would also end up tainting how we approach. And, and I, I can, for those of you who might be listening, maybe a, a simple analogy might be cybersecurity and internet. So everybody can relate to it. You spoke about our cell phones yeah. and online. Most of what we do is very reactive. But the fascinating thing is, on our coast region, the, if you look at the heat map of where there's a lot of fraudulent cybercrime on the coast, I know people don't like to hear this, but Ghana, Togo, Nigeria, we're a hotspot for this. The fascinating thing is, the people who know how to fix this or solve this, these problems, they're here. In the U.S., for example, when you find somebody who's forged, uh, whether it's from banking, and this is traditional, in the finance, anytime they find somebody who's been able to beat the system, they don't just throw them away and lock them. They recruit them. Mm. They ask them to share their ideas. In Ghana, we've had a lot of arrests made from, uh, by uh, people who were engaged in what's known as the Simbox fraud. These are people who are able to use technology to, you know, beat the system yeah. and make international calls without having to pay okay. much. And right. then I, I don't know how they make the money, but I find them to be very smart people. And, and that's, that's a bit of, I wanted to bring a relatable example because typically regulation catches up with life. We're all very innovative and we've been innovative from time immemorial. We find something, somebody might give us something and say, oh, use it for this. And then later on you observe, you're like, wait a minute, mm. this can be used for something completely different. Right. The same thing happens in the US. The difference is that they can commercialize it. Mm. So they can make it into a product and sell it and make more money. For us, we're not even looking. So we need to have that opportunity to say, okay, fine. We have a lot of young people. Most of them are tech savvy. Most of them, most of us are, are able to have access to devices quite quickly and have a global conversation. If we study and analyze them, what cultural practice can be used to monetize and create new businesses that we don't even know about yet? 
But if we are constantly saying that, catch them, throw them away, this is bad, this is not, you create a close-minded um, society that doesn't learn from the way that people are using things that they'll pay for. In marketing, one of the biggest things that they say is that sell people what they want. If I know what you want, you give me your money without me asking. Recently, the media met the president. Yes. Uh, one of the issues that came up was Sakawa, mm. uh, especially within Zongo communities. Right. What you are saying just brings back the issue of Sakawa to yes. mind. Yes. So are you saying that instead of saying Sakawa is bad, arrest all those boys that we could make better use of their talents? And this is, and I love this example as well. So as an academic, if you take Sakawa, and Sakawa is financial malfeasance, yeah. being able to, um, so in Nigeria, it would be people sending in emails, and there are statistics yeah. that if you send a thousand emails, there's a percentage of people who report and will be gullible enough yeah. um, to do that. Same thing in Ghana, where people would, might use credit card fraud and other things in order to purchase things where they don't have the assets or money. The funny, fascinating thing is, tackling Sakawa is tackling the symptom and not the root cause. The truth of the matter is we don't have a friendly financial system in Ghana that allows you to engage on the internet and participate in a commerce system. So what you're doing now is saying that, oh, you're cheating the headache and the sweat, but then the person has malali mm. malaria and mm. you're not giving malarial symptoms. So I'll give an example. My colleagues and, and my sister is visiting from the U.S. and we're yeah. talking about this, the arts, creative arts, all the things that they have. And we're like, how do we share this globally? I have friends of mine who've dropped out of college because they're able to sell sneakers on Shopify.com, Amazon.com. Mm. The reason why a student would be able to do that is the internet is barely, it's completely free. There's already a, um, a website that allows you to showcase one of the, all the products, but there's also an address system, mailing and shipping system. So all the, the, the student has to do is, you want something, I display it mm. based on the system of things that work properly. I showcase it. If you pay me, you pay me the money I'm asking for. You get the product and deliver, and, and it's delivered in a professional manner. In Ghana, however, the number of things you have to go through in order to pay for a bill, to pay for something, is so big. So you find out that people now use the loopholes in order to create opportunities for getting resources. Mm -hmm. People now say, "Well, if there isn't an economy that allows me to engage online." engage digitally and I see my counterparts in China, mm. uh, in Singapore, um, in Japan and all these fascinating places engaging. Why do you think I'll sit down as, an, as a child of the soil, Ghanaian soil that is innovative? So that's what we need to interrogate. We need to interrogate what are the op opportunities, the ways that young people are practicing commerce. How do we commercialize it in a way that is not detriment to them so that they can unlock all these economic opportunities that they're doing so that it's legal. And when it becomes legal, it's almost a good example is like marijuana. For years, I grew up, and, and my parents and my time, and those of us who went to boarding school, you know, you cannot touch it. Those, those are my friends in Cape, <laughs> Cape Coast. You'll be branded yeah. with yeah. we are marijuana, mm. right? Leading up to it, now people have understood, researched the plants, and now that the government has made it legal, millions in Canada and other places. So what I'm saying is let's relook at the perception of Sakawa and look at it as, young people with a lot of energy buying and selling on a global platform whether it's e-commerce or not so the role of government is what create an infrastructure that makes it easy or attractive mm -hmm. for businesses to thrive on that and then you can tax them then now you're taking that skill and service in order to serve a need because the need is there okay so uh, let's begin to wrap up and um, before we do that I mean, definitely before we wrap up I'll ask you when the forum is starting yes and uh, ex with you specifically what role you will be playing uh, if you'll be speaking at any point uh, if you'll be able to tell us what you'll be talking about but before that you have been talking about technology yes globalization yes and I'm just wondering so how does the future look like in terms of work when people wake up and say i'm going to work basically in our minds there's a certain place a certain location called work that we arrive at and there's a certain desk that we sit behind to now begin to do what is called work mm. so work is both a noun and a verb mm. um how, how does it look like um it appears that then the first definition where work is a location yes a certain place will become not 
Yes. Very soon. And, and it's so fascinating for me because you hit the nail right on the head. The series of questions that the World Economic Forum is asking is, what is the future of work? Patriotism versus global citizen. Mm. These are pain points. Um, automation, these type of things. So sp speaking specifically on work as a destination, I think, and it's, it's always fascinating for me because before we had industrialized work, so industrialization, people were apprentices. You were, you were an apprentice to somebody, you learned from a craftsman, even in legal profession. It wasn't necessarily law school. Um, and, and so over the last maybe 80 years or so, 50 to 80 years, we've kind of industrialized everything and we've, ha we've created this factory where you go to a math school after grade one, grade two, grade three. And we've forgotten that before that, we didn't necessarily have the institution of schools for you to come out to a place and be work. But we had skills and crafts. What is also happening now, and, and, and it sp speaks a little bit about Impact Hub Accra, where, where we met, mm. is also people and our practices, we would always be innovative in finding the least cost to maximizing profit. So if it's going to cost me a lot of money to have a single stationary place as a work, whether it's paying for rent, the utilities and others, but then I, I am serving a global audience. So the, speaking to the early definition of globalization where barriers are, are low, the internet allows you to communicate, interact, share resources, learn from and teach as well. Then this one solitary place that might be high on my overhead. All I might need is the access. So you can have the access at home. You can have that access that is shared. I might need just five hours in a day. So it doesn't, I don't necessarily need to invest as much in a certain space. So these type of things are the early things that we're seeing that are challenging over the last uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, where people were rewarded. You knew that you, you worked for a firm, mm -hmm. you worked for mm -hmm. a corporate, you had a name badge. Yeah. <laughs> so when people ask you, what, is, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You identified that with the company and a specific yeah. role. So one, economics is changing. Two, automation and technology is also changing the skill sets that are needed now. And that's why I was uh, and loosely laid back to when you find young people innovating and doing something that regulation hasn't caught up, don't shut them down because they're probably trying to find a new type of occupation or skill set that hasn't been caught up or framed yet. Mm. So what we're seeing now is a lot of people are able to be consultants. First, we saw telemarketers. So the corporates that came in, what, te what was telemarketers? Instead of going there, yeah. speaking to this person, mm -hmm. They create a room, there'll be 10 people, and then they can speak to thousands of people on a certain pro problem. So it became incredibly well managed, but it became efficient. Mm. So as the world is becoming more efficient, and I speak to automation, so automation is when machine learning, very simple tasks can be replicated almost precisely and perfected over a long period of time. So you can automate little things. A good example is those of you who use Word, computers, all of these things, you can copy and paste multiple documents together. Automation goes beyond that. It, 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 it impacts agriculture, it impacts science. We have these machines that are able to learn things and replicate them at a much faster rate than we can. What does that mean? That it means that some of the jobs that we learned that, that are basic in skill are, n are becoming redundant because it is cost efficient for me to let it be automated rather than to hire a human being. Exactly, and that brings me to my next question, yes. which I hope we'll address quickly. Yes. Then uh, we uh, get to the, the World up. Economic uh, Forum itself and uh, what's going to happen there. Uh, apart from technology taking away our job opportunities, traditional job opportunities, you have talked about the possibility of creating jobs through technology, yes. but there's also the potential yes. of losing jobs yeah. because of technology. The other issue is that our generation is increasingly becoming subservient, slaves mm -hmm. to technology. Okay. And so families have broken up because of technology. Okay. You are on WhatsApp, your wife is on WhatsApp, mm -hmm. and the children are neglected. They get into, oh, you know what I'm talking about. It's, right. it's, it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. So even as we hail technology, yeah. what will the World Economic Forum talk about when the focus comes on technology because uh, you would not want to overemphasize the importance of technology uh, to the importance of family, for instance. Great points. Um, I, and I think, so one of the things I love to do is also always 
look at for example when say um what's up breaks families it's, it's usually the symptom and then the root causes the way we interact and do things is changing fundamentally so as human beings the time that we have the expectations we have of our productivity is changing typically and i speak to a lot of rotarians and then family members older family members when my parents were in their 20s and 30s the ambitions that we've given to ourselves our inherited were nowhere near what they maybe a few people wanted to do a lot mm. but lately we're quite ambitious and some of us are able to get it done because we have technology to help us plan our lives emails to quickly do certain things and then more resources in order to try new things that were probably not present that being said jobs have always changed over time so whether it was before farming subsistence farming before industrialization where we had mass noun farming tools that can do things more efficiently but i'll give another one and people tend to forget a bit about that the introduction of microsoft word mm. there were people who went to school to be typists yeah, yeah. but we, at that time there wasn't such a huge mm -hmm. uproar about it but then now, now you don't need the typist. You can learn to type. You can have apps like Mabus Vegan, yeah, yeah. and you can type that. So, and as much as the job has become redundant, we should not let the job becoming redundant mean that our people and our productivity as knowledge workers become redundant. Mm. So that goes back to education. One of the things that we pride ourselves here as Ghanaians, and we have beacons of Ghanaians who are leading the charge in education on here, Patrick Owa, Fred Swanika, many others. And most Ghanaians, we, we thrive on education. What we've done, though, is we've made a stop on the certification and degree acquisition. Your education doesn't stop when you get a degree or a PhD or a master's or an undergrad. Every time you work in either a, a global company or not, you learn new ways. You learn how to be agile. You learn how to communicate with people from different languages. That is where you start to acquire new skills. So once you look at it that way, all of a sudden, the jobs that are like typists that Microsoft Word and other, other personal computer took away... Now you learn that, wait a minute, I can become a graphic designer. I can, so we're in a transitionary period. Um, so the forum does address that. Every industrialized period, so that's why globalization and the fourth industrial, so mm. the, the 4.0 is assuming, um, and the theory and the train of thought is that there were one, two, and three kind of steps. And, and during each of those times, there was friction because the people who are currently competent were educated yesterday, not with today's roles. Mm. Those are the ones that feel the most friction. So you talk about that. What we have to do today is to educate people today for tomorrow's roles that we don't know about. And that's, what, that's where education comes in. That's where we need to start. Creativity comes in. That's where we need to, to teach soft skills, not go in and do this precisely um, because the world is changing. Okay, yes. so uh, we, we have to wrap up now. So sure. quickly, uh, when is the forum starting? Yes. And what role? Uh, are you playing? So I'm humbled to be um, a member of the Global Shaper community. Um, so I'm one of 40 invited guests. Um, we're going to be tasked on being part of different discussions and panels. Um, so I'm going there, one, as an, a bit of an academic and two, as um, an entrepreneur speaking on innovation based in Africa. So what I'm excited about is speaking about a lot of the things that we're doing locally that is innovative. Um, and, and most of those things might seem basic to most people but the rest of the world is catching on. Um, so things like shea butter, things, um, our foods, um, looking at things of how we use mobile technology, how we communicate digitally, um, and how people are able to learn from each other, whether it's Facebook groups and, and WhatsApp, how we use it differently from what it was initially thought of. Um, I'd have a chance to kind of spotlight and share with the things that are going on on the continent. Um, and then how people are able to use things like mobile phones and bicycles to deliver um, blood or healthcare mm -hmm. or to teach. Um, and how now people are also using, and a good example is Nyaho Medical Center, mm -hmm. um, telehealth, being able to use that in order to plug into bigger institutions with more resources by filling in that expertise gap. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's really my role to, to present some of the things that we've been able to see here um, in, in Ghana, in Accra, but then generally on the continent as well. Um, I'm also there to, to really um, remind the global leaders that the young people were also competent. We are also just as interested. Um, these opportunities are, are few and in between because Davos has 3,000 people. So imagine out of 3,000, 40 is a, a small fraction mm -hmm. in comparison. Um, but we're looking to break down doors, make sure that we are also very digitally engaged. So on social media, 
um, at Global Shape as Accra on my personal handle at EA Gamore. I, I'll be sharing some of these thoughts and lessons um, and then unpacking that once we come back we also have meetings and sessions where we say oh this makes sense um, but this is what we're challenging and hopefully that way we can educate ourselves. The forum is starting on January 22nd mm. um, it goes on to the 25th um, but I'll be in Davos for pre-Davos engagements with other young leaders across the world um, around the 20th as well. Right. You know, thanks so very much uh, for pleasure. your time this evening. I've uh, learned so much from you and Such I must say that I am very, very proud of you. And Thank I know you. that many of our viewers are equally uh, proud of you. Thank and uh, we do hope that um, when you finally get to Davos, you'll be able to articulate most of the issues that you've raised here and... Um, Hopefully, somebody will listen and hopefully some difference will be made eventually. We've been speaking with Emmanuel Agweko Gamo. He is, the world, he is a member of the World Economic Forum and uh, he will be attending this year's World Economic Forum in Davos uh, uh, he, this year. Uh, he says it's uh, starting on January 22nd and it will go on until January 25th. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, it's been exciting speaking with you. Uh, and we do hope when you eventually return yes, home, I would love we to. should have another conversation to find out yes. what actually happened at the, at the forum. I hope you will make yourself available again. More than happy to. All right. Thank you very much. And you thank mentioned you. Dubai. I'll be there and I'll give you a report. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> have a very good evening. Many thanks for being a part of the show. We'll see you again tomorrow when we bring you another edition. Have a very good night. Bye-bye. Night to welcome many fans for joining us. We bring you the real stories. I've done that. I've done that. Have you put the pen in the <laughs> My environment alone will tell you that I'm rich. I've chosen to be in one of the very shallow places. They also do have misguns, but it doesn't mean that all of them are criminals. We do not have a good geo database of our mineral resources. This is time for us to share the oil money. So terrorism is not going to be accepted on this continent. We see them coming here and going back there, don't we kill But God willing, I'll be back alive. We are just about leaving on the night patrol with the it's AU forces cool. here in Somalia. The real issues, the real talk. We are working together for the development of Ghana. It means that we have separation of powers. Already we're talking about moving from what? A deficit of some 9% to 6.5%. The critical challenge that faces every leader in the world today is the issue of creating jobs. We will put at least one million people to work. Ghana, after 60 years, has a public structure that is not responsive. Yes. Mr. Abdul President, I don't know this is your name, it's your <laughs> Join me, Abdul Hai Moment. The men tonight, from Monday to Friday, 8.15 p.m. to 9.15 p.m. on GBC 24.